Hi, this is Jared K. Anderson, here to tell you a little bit about the book I have coming out, Something in the Woods Loves You. And afterwards, I'll share a clip of the audiobook as well. The idea for Something in the Woods Loves You arose after I began posting regularly about my struggles with chronic major depression. I shared scraps of poetry describing the ways my mental and emotional pain shift when I walk beneath the trees. I offered metaphors that helped me manage the shame and silence surrounding mental illness. Often, I thought of these posts as notes to self, reminders of strategies that work for me, so that I could have them close at hand when my own mind and memory became untrustworthy on the hard days. The more I stepped into the light and openly discussed my pain, the more connection and validation I found among a community of folks with similar interests and challenges. More and more, my inbox began to fill with messages about mental health and kind words of thanks for my honest and vulnerable posts. I spoke with fellow sufferers who wanted to talk shop. There were parents, siblings, and spouses reaching out to me to ask what they could do to help loved ones grappling with depression. There were also people who simply wanted to connect in order to feel less alone in their battle with a disease that so often pushes us toward isolation. I wanted to spend days chatting with each of them, sharing my experiences, my victories, and my setbacks. I wanted to walk with them beneath the trees and talk about what I had learned. I began to think of this imagined conversation as the long talk. I wanted to have the long talk with these strangers. Eventually, I began to understand that I also wanted to have the long talk with myself to map out my own journey with mental illness and the healing I found in nature so I could truly understand where I had been and what I had learned along the way. These were the motivations behind Something in the Woods Loves You. I needed to articulate what I knew, both for myself and for others. I felt that the woods were medicinal, but if I was to turn that feeling into medicine for others, aid I could share, I needed to coax my feelings into words. Moreover, the nature of my own depression means that my own memory is not always a reliable keeper of important lessons and milestones. So I've learned to lean on writing as a potent magic to prevent mental illness from weathering away the positive signposts of my emotional landscape. I was initially drawn to the project of writing this book as a service to others, but I quickly realized that it was also an act of care for myself. Yes, Something in the Woods Loves You is the long talk I wanted to have with anyone interested in mental health, but is also an artifact of identity that I believe will be a compass to me in the years to come, pointing me toward kindness and toward the wild places and creatures I love. There is magic and medicine in giving ourselves permission to love what we love and to let it love us back. The love in this book is rooted in the plants and animals of the Ohio woodlands where I roam. Sharing that love is part of my healing process, and, I hope, a small light of solidarity in the dark for others struggling with mental illness. Enjoy this preview of the audiobook of Something in the Woods Loves You. The book is released on September 10th. For more information on pre-ordering, visit jaredkanderson.com. There's an old story about great blue herons. It says that while hunting the twilight shallows, herons can produce a strange luminescent powder, pluck it from beneath their feathers with their spear-like beaks, and sprinkle it on the dark water to attract fish. Picture it. Iridescent bluegill rising up beneath the surface, drawn to sudden phantom starlight beneath the shadowed canopy of a great bird's wings. The motes of cold fire sparkling in their unblinking eyes. Above, beyond the glimmer, 
A beak like a frozen thunderbolt paints a dull gold slash in the air. The fish are not curious in an intellectual way. It's a physical thing. Their bodies called forward to witness the inexplicable. There, in the shallow winter waters, they are ready to believe in miracles. This old story is a myth, but it's not hard to imagine why such a story gets passed on. It tells a figurative truth within a literal falsehood, a pathway to a kind of knowledge. Yes, technically speaking, it's a lie. Technically speaking, you can look at any human life as the sum of a complex collection of chemical reactions, in much the same way as you can look at any beautiful painting as a simple collection of pigments, which is to say, you can miss the point of anything. Some herons migrate, but here in Ohio I tend to see them all winter long, tall and solitary, moving with a deliberate slowness that complements the placid waters in which they wade. They look pensive and intense, thin wanderers in rags divining the future by studying ripples on the leaden waters of January. They are a mix of shaggy and angular, a blade of yellow stone dressed in flowing robes stitched from overcast skies. From beneath, a fish's perspective, they are the pale hue of heavy afternoon clouds. From above, the darker shade of flinty shallows. All of this, the slowness, the camouflage, the living statue and the stillness, it all blooms outward from that long yellow beak like a sunset dagger poised in the air. Herons are gray wanderers. They are shards of winter landscape. They are the sky from below, and, from above, they are the dark water regarding itself. No, they don't produce glowing dust. But if you don't think herons are magic, I suggest you need to broaden your definition of that word. They can symbolize fear, or gluttony, or grace, or patience. It depends on who you ask. I have difficulty interpreting the nature of my own life, a thing I feel intimately and continuously, so it's not surprising that we can't all agree on the nature of herons. What, then, is a blue heron? They live about 15 years. They stand around four feet tall. They walk the shoreline, delivering an overt message to me about quiet contemplation and self-determination. The heron is exactly what the heron is to you in the moment you choose to give it meaning. It will be that meaning until you decide it means something else. That's how meaning works. It's a subjective act of interpretation. You might get the impression that I'm saying herons are meaningless, but that's not what I'm saying at all. When I see a heron and interpret its behavior as a reminder for me to slow down and think about what actually matters in my life, that is what the heron means. Meaning, like many crafts, happens in collaboration between maker and materials. There's nothing nihilistic about this. 